uh, let's say the quaternary time scales, uh, the, the human appearances, which was there around somewhere around 2.8 million years, BB stands for present, BC, as you know, stands for uh, before Christian era. And in, in our last paper, the journalists looked up. They mixed up BP and BC, therefore they missed by 2000 years, and there were a lot of controversies. But this is the time when the genus Homo sapiens appeared as the carnivorous scavengers. And then we go from here to there through periodic time. We go to the Bronze Age when the Indus Valley civilizations are there, followed by the Iron Age and the recorded history. During this time, there were quantum jump of the human evolution. If you, if you look, for example, up to this time period, for example, up to this time period, Human beings were essentially hunter-gatherers. They were living in caves, they were hunting and that's how they were surviving. Something happened that they developed their uh, brain functions in such a way they started developing the activation, so early farming started. They started, uh, uh, what do you call, writing. So the early Mesopotamian writing was around 3,700, you add it up, 2,000, that's 5,700. They started developing the copper painted eggs. If you go to the Britain, for example, the Stone Age constructions, and they also started developing or making potteries, which you even use today. And then came the very planned development of the cities, Indus Valleys, Mesopotamia, the Akkadian empires, where from simple rural mud houses, they started building houses which were made by bricks or made by stones. Not only that, the cities were very planned and they developed a very, very well hierarchical, you know, uh, society as a function of time. And then, of course, after the Indus Valley Civilization Denise was there, the Iron Age came, in the northern India, the painted rivers are there, and then comes the classical media in the modern history. Now, this is an archaeological sequence, but for geologists, as you know, that we always call these as a kind of junction between quaternary and Holocene. Okay? It's a very time we use this term. We use, we use principally for studying sedimentology or climate and things like that. But for me, I found out that this is the time when not only the climate changes were taking place, but there were a tremendous evolution of the mankind. In fact, in the University of Manchester, there is a professor uh, who is an archaeology professor but he's a computer specialist, he works on the cognitive behavior of the human being. That what made the man suddenly develop their brain function, that they started developing cities, they learned advanced agriculture, they started developing all these things, but these were not there. So was there a climate connection between these? That, that the evolution was triggered by something. We always know from theological record that always any kind of extinction evolution boundaries triggers to an advanced form of life, right? Because the life or the crisis teaches you how to adapt with the system and you better adapt and develop. That is how the evolution goes on. So that is what, what was my interest that this is a time period over the last, let us say, 30 years I have been working on the climate of the water lines. So it drew me to these archaeology that why not explore a little bit where there is some scope of work. And after all, when you work, on a particular field for a long time, we also start getting bored, you know. The whole life, if you start working on the granites, I mean, sometime, I think you will get fat. Okay. But more than that, there are some very interesting things. If you look at the current dispensation, what is going on in our country, you know that there are, there are a lot of debates. For example, uh, how old the Vedas are? You know, people will tell the Vedas are 10,000 years. You will see in WhatsApp that Vedas are 20,000 years. Although you know that in 20,000 years back, the man was hunter gatherer, no question of writing the script. <laughs> you have also heard that Indians used to make planes, okay? And of course, you also hear that Indians used to know civil engineering so that you have an answer. Okay? <laughs> okay, this is very, very common, you will see. Right or wrong, I mean, you know, as a scientist, science is very cruel. Science does not care what you think, science does not care what is your ideology. Science wants evidence. Okay? So therefore, always the boundary between mythology and science is very, very blurred. And the only way to remove this blurring 
is to really produce scientific data so that some of these very, very interesting problems can be solved. After all, there is no denying of the fact that over the Indian subcontinent, we have different settlements, very, very old, advanced settlement, very, very old. So there is a scope of doing a lot of work which can raise some very interesting information. Okay. Also, as you know that we are living at a time which we call Anthropocene. Okay? And uh, very recently, the International Subcommission on Stratigraphy, they are trying to fix up that what would be the marker of Anthropocene. So one suggestion was plastic would be the marker of Anthropocene. And uh, the study of archaeology, which you think or many people think is a, is a, is a study of dead people, I will try to convince you that it is not the study of dead people. You learn a lot of things which has bearing with our future climate change or what is happening uh, by the present mankind as you know Stephen Hawking has said is a very bright mind he said that another 200 years we leave and then we have to find out another planet okay so we try to see that how we can learn from our planet like that but uh, for a guard student this would be a very very interesting proposition to marry an archaeologist. Okay. okay, jokes apart. This, this is an archaeological mound. Generally, you find these mounds like this. These are all covered. But as you dig it up, you find that the structures are coming up. So, excavations. Excavations are done by the archaeologists. Sometimes the excavation goes on for 10 years, 20 years, because you have to very carefully do it, otherwise it will crumble. Okay. But conventionally, over a very long period of time, more classical approach has been adopted to study the Indian archaeology. Okay. So you can say that it was like stamp collection, that you collect the material, put them in the museum, or put them in some godown, and nobody studies them. Okay. But that is what not that the archaeology, for example, of Harappa and Mohenjo worked out. They are the best archaeology school of US, for example, or, or British uh, Natural History Museum. They have been working for a very, very long time, employing state-of-the-art uh, technologies, and therefore you know a lot more about Egyptian civilization, Harappa and Mohenjo Daro compared to our part, where we also have equivalent civilization. For a very long time. I just give you one example that where the archaeology is going today. Many of you, especially those who teach remote sensing or study remote sensing, you know that there is a technique called LIDAR, okay? which is nothing but light detection and ranging, which can be land based but it can be airborne based also. You basically shoot a laser and you can find out what is there beneath, beneath the surface or beneath the forest, you can find out. And this is in 2018, uh, there was a huge megapolis was discovered below the Guatemala jungle, okay? and which is about 4,000 years old. Now, obviously, as you can understand, a te technology which is essentially used to measure the sea level changes or the geomorphology, exactly the same technology is being used to find out the archaeological remains. Okay? So you have you, you you use a lot of modern techniques for studying uh, studying the archaeology. You know, as George Weatherly, who is one time very great uh, geochemist, <coughs> said that uh, we are increasingly studying finer and finer particles by bigger and bigger instruments. Right. So we use a uh, huge transmission electron microscope to study molecules. <coughs> we huge uh, scanning electron microscope to study foraminifera. And this is what is one of the very old accelerator mass spectrometer that takes the archaeological or geological material of Lawrence Livermore Laboratory. And this is a picture of carbonized cereal that is wheat, which is old, and they have been converted to black carbon. And this can be dated by this, this what you call this mass spectrometer. You can see this is a person standing, so you can easily understand the scale of the machines. The huge linear accelerators which are actually uh, fitted with a uh, mass spectrometer. But today, uh, the technology has improved, and therefore, as you can see, the left side, you have a very modern facility of physical research laboratory in Ahmedabad, which is the accelerator uh, mass spectrometer facility. Okay. Now, what do you do with this? You basically try to 
make the organized material which you find in the archaeology or you find in the geological layers. Many quaternary geologists, for example, for finding out the dates, they use these AMS facilities. For archaeologists particularly, you know, when you dig up a particular archaeological site, you also get a lot of quaternaries as you can see here. This is from Sanal UP. Uh, this is a picture I borrowed from Archaeological Survey of India. And these quaternaries, as you know, that when they make a quaternary, which is called a matta, you know, they put it in a uh, furnace. So you heat it up and therefore you reset what you call as far as the optically stimulated luminescence is concerned. So you use a technique, a way cell dating technique, by which you can actually date simultaneously these quaternaries. Okay, so you have two dating techniques. One is you are using uh, carbon dating materials for dating, and you are directly dating these quaternaries which have been dumped from these archaeological uh, archaeological sites. This is what is what we have been able to develop in IIT Kharagpur over the last uh, you know probably six seven years. Uh, that is, this is the stabilizer facility which studies climate vegetation. Uh, human migration by using a variety of low mass uh, elements, isotope oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and sulfur. And this is the geochronology facility where you do dating, you try to study chemistry, the people who are working on sediments, they try to study the provenance studies. And but the same techniques can be used for archaeology also. Okay? So there is nothing you are studying material. Okay? And uh, if you look the so today what, uh, what I do. There are many many techniques, but I will try to concentrate what is my specialization. Okay? That is, I am basically a geologist, learn a little bit of isotope systematics. So I will try to employ some of these and try to show that what the Indus Valley civilization has taught us by using these tracers. Now, if you look at, at the isotopes, as you can see, you can use a, use these isotopes for a variety of systems. Okay? You can study for oil exploration or mineral exploration. You can study for planetary science, for petrology, you can study ocean circulation, atmospheric, hydrological cycles, climate change. There is a huge application in agriculture, photosynthesis. Uh, there is a lot of application in medicines. Okay, for example, from where your gallbladder stone is coming, many, many hospitals they have these hospitometers. And of course, uh, there is a lot of application in forensic science and in archaeology where you use nitrogen, oxygen and carbon dioxide. And it is this technique which generally people apply for study the archaeological processes. It is almost like a kind of detective who is trying to find out certain specific, you know, prime problem. Just to give an example, there was a girl whose name was Miss Lake Francois. Her body was found in the east coast of USA and the API did not make out that where from this girl came this way. Okay? That was the girl killed in the east coast or was the girl brought from the west coast like somewhere around like San Francisco, brought here, killed and buried and came into the rescue, the stabilizer. The only remain which was available was the hair, the teeth and some bones of these guards buried under the ground. And they sort the problem, the FBI ultimately sort the problem working as just like a detective fingerprint. So if you go to the Washington DC for example, the FBI has a huge office and they have also stabilized the program. I wish sometimes our CBI also has stabilized the program. Okay. What are the materials which are available for studying? This is from uh, Northwestern India, a place called Parmana. The full skeleton has been unearthed, so you have the samples which are bones, teeth, even the food grains, and this is for example a deer teeth which has been found, and this is a cattle bone, these are the crops which can be dated by the AMS facility, and time table can go from million years to weeks, and depending on what material you are studying and what kind of technology you are producing. In particular, bones and teeth are very, very robust. You know, you are all early students, you know, that diagenesis is a very tardy thing. Okay? You have an original rock, diagenetically it can change the chemistry. So, the bones and teeth are also no, no, no exception. But particularly, if you have bio which are 
basically hydroxy apatite. They have this kind of chemistry, okay? You have oxygen here, different compounds. You have also carbon. And you have roughly about 40% chloride and the And as I was telling that the, manage, the, the same paper, which has come up yesterday actually, in, uh, uh, and that is because a huge coverage day in New York Times and all, it is this protein, if at all it is preserved in this bone, they study for ancient DNA to find out what is the origin of this material. Okay. And what you do, you do a very lot of chemistry. Okay. It's a very, very difficult chemistry. Phosphate, bone is essentially phosphate. Phosphate radical is very strong, you're going to break it down. So you have to break it at a very high temperature if you want to study the oxygen. So, and therefore, this is for example a sharp peak, which is roughly about 55 million years old. You do a lot of chemistry and eventually get or extract, you know, silver phosphate which looks like this. Okay, you can imagine that this is a scale of 100 micron. And you measure these uh, silver phosphate for their oxygen isotope by burning at a very high Okay, so this is how we do. So, so, so this is analysis takes a lot of time. There are a lot of problem of contaminations, but eventually uh, in our lab we had been able to do, uh, do these things. So what do they tell you? I will not go into very great detail. If you want to study past climate, for example if you want to study the rain, the drought, the temperature, the migration for example from where did the people, people come, okay? The Mesopotamian people, they used to have very strong trade connections, right? Between the uh, Indus Valley. Today also we have, in the past also we have. So obviously when you have a connection, there is a meeting of it. Okay? So the big one is will marry, you know, Punjabis, Punjabis will marry some Iranians. So this happens, so this must have been happening during those days also, albeit maybe in a smaller scale because that time there was no transportation except in sea route or land route. You can also find out that and for doing this, you use essentially hydrogen and oxygen. Okay? For studying the first climate. And you can also try to find out the paleo diet, that is what they were eating. Okay? And uh, as uh, uh, I think Sam Epstein, a very one time, very great uh, ice cream dude, he said that you are what you eat plus you might be extra. That means if I am eating, you know, basically grasses, then my, my bone will also have that input. Okay. Or if somebody is eating some other kind of material, the bone will imprint in their carbon isotopes. So you have basically protein, for example, which has carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, and oxygen. Fat, for example, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Carbohydrate also has carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And these nutrients they fractionate depending upon the sources as well as the food oils. Okay, from the lower chain of the food oil to the upper part of the food oil, the successively fraction. Now, when we are trying to do oxygen isotope, I said that you can find out what the rain or what the water kind of was there. This is a kind of simulation where the scientists from all over the world, they have virtually mapped the entire globe in terms of oxygen isotope or hydrogen isotope. Okay? As you can see that it's a continuous change, it's a monthly variations. And the color codes are telling you that it is varying from minus 2 per mil to minus 30 per mil. Essentially, what I mean to say that every area has a very specific isotopic composition in terms of either oxygen or hydrogen. Okay? So if you are in Calcutta, if you live here for 5 minus 10 years, your bone, your blood, your body fluid, they will have the signature of the Calcutta. If you leave it to, if you live in Rajasthan, because it is an extremely different kind of climate, you have a high evaporating, the oxygen isotopes are highly enriched, you will have that kind of stuff. So that gives you a kind of handle to trace from where the people have been coming. Because the water which you drink, that is ingested inside our body in terms of bone, in terms of blood, in terms of our body fluid. Okay? So that is the fundamental, fundamental assumption what uh, we will go on. So therefore, let me just kind of summarize how does it work. Imagine that you have mammal bone or two oxygen isotope, which essentially is equal to what they are drinking, right? What they are drinking it is going to their bone and tooth. 
and this drinking water at any given place is essentially dependent on the rainfall. Okay, whatever the kind of rainfall you have. Calcutta rainfall is one kind, uh, Rajasthan rainfall is one kind, sources are different. Calcutta, majority of the rain comes from Bay of Bengal. In Rajasthan, in Western India, it comes from Arabian Sea, so the waters are different. Okay, so in other way, you can essentially by analyzing these whole or two oxygen isotope, you can talk about the rainfall. Okay, and there are many, many ways. Either, either you can talk about the rainfall in a gross manner, that means the rainfall composition over a year, but there are techniques available where you can go even to the seasonal scale. That means how, when the animal was growing, how their uh, oxygen isotope composition was changing as a function of time. So, this is one way uh, you do. The other way, as I was telling you, by using the isotopes of carbon. One carbon, that is 14, which has a very small half life, is used for dating, as I said, by accelerator musculature. The stable isotopes of carbon, you can use them to distinguish the types of plant which are there. Okay? Dominantly, globally, you can classify all the plants into two categories either the C3 plants, which are the big plants, for example, the jackfruit plant or the mango plants, and you have C4 plants which are essentially the grasses and the shrubs and they develop much later during the Miocene time and this, 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 these photosynthetic pathways uh, are also known as the Galvin cycle and uh, they have been uh, they have been widely used for reconstructing the vegetation in the geological or the archaeological parts okay let me just give you one and then I will switch over to industrial civilization okay you know if you go to the Israel side and the Middle East side. This is the Mediterranean. This is the Persian Gulf. This is the Red Sea. Okay. And if you go here, along all around this region, you have excellent archaeological remains. For example, Syria. Okay. Many of the archaeological remains are destroyed completely because of the war which is going on there. But if you go there, there are fantastic archaeological remains. Okay. Of various kinds, of various ages. As you can see here, the ages are Babylonian age, ages are Assyrian age, ages which are known as the Phoenician age. So there are at different stages there are ages and the civilization grew. The question which archaeologists have been asking that where are the local people? Or the people who are going from here to there, here to there, or even from India to there. Okay? Now how do you do that? In these all these archaeological sites like this, this is for example Telido which is a uh, coast of Israel in the Mediterranean. As you can see, these are the archaeological remains. And when we developed this uh, phosphate isotope technique, uh, the University of Haifa people wrote to us that they have such an excellent problem we would like to collaborate and we readily agree. And uh, because they have a center of maritime civilization at the University of Haifa. Okay. Hmm? Telgo, the place name is Telgo. So you have Phoenician, Assyrian, Babylonian, so different, different levels of levels of civilizations. Anyway, so essentially, you know, in all these layers, what you find, you find this fish. Very funny. They were they were fishing just because they were living in the coast. Take bangles from this. You know these sponge bangles. You go to these our. Um, you know all these uh, shops you will be getting, which we call shakha, and incidentally, this shakha is owned only by Bengal and Bihar women. You don't see it in the northern India people are doing very much. You don't see it in the western India people are very much. I do not know what is the reason because industrial civilization never came east of Ganges. Okay, they never came. Nevertheless, it was a huge, huge industry. Archaeologists call it as Bengal industry, and you get these which are known as the carbon and the pine which we call Fonku or Bond shells. Okay. Now these are extremely useful in knowing the seasonality of during that time. If you cut these, what you will get, you will get growth ring. You know that the, uh, either you call a pericyport or you have a gastropod, you have a growth rings, right? And the growth ring grows as the seasonality goes on, right? So the oxygen isotopes or the carbon isotopes in those growth rings 
may presumably record that climatic conditions. But to do this, you know, in the seasonality, you just cannot do it by a simple measures. So far, for example, about five or six years back, we used to make very small drilling by using dental drilling which the uh, doctors use. But today in our lab, for example, we have developed a technique where we can use the laser beam to go even just like your electron microprobe at a resolution of about 50 micron to about uh, 100 micron where we can get very high resolution analysis uh, system. For example, if you have these, if you have this gas report, if you, if you cut it, you will get this growth ring. Right? This growth ring normally by dental drill you cannot do because dental drill will take you about half a millimeter side. But if you have a laser which is there here, you can shoot the laser and you can continuously get the analysis. And look at the very fine structures which is getting. This is from you know Indian Ocean. And as you can see, Indian Ocean has a climate variability between summer and winter, which is very nicely reflected in the isotopic compositions of these. This is a subject in itself which is known as the sclerochronology. If you want to know whether the seasonal variations between the dry and the warm season was same as today or different, people are very heavily using this technique. One uh, brief video which might interest you.
when the world was reconciled with the discovery of Harappa and Mohenjo-daro, both designated as UNESCO World Heritage Sites at present. But there remains the yet another little known, the most impressive Harappan site of Thola Vira in the greater run of Kutch, Gujarat, India, only a few hundred kilometers from Mohenjo-daro and Harappa. <coughs> the site was discovered in 1966 by an archaeologist, Mr. Jamie Joshi, and the excavation began only around 1990. The Archaeological Survey of India opines that the discovery of Thula Vida has indeed added a new dimension to the Indus Valley civilization. More precisely, the existence of the Arabans on the east of the Indus, on the Indian side of the Indo-Pakistan border, in the greater run of Kutch in Gujarat. It is located on the Khadir Island, or better known as the Khadir Bet, within the desert wildlife sanctuary of the run of Kutch. Area of the site is more than 250 square acres, and the ancient city was occupied by the Arabas from 2650 BC, declining slowly after 2100 BC. It was briefly abandoned and reoccupied until 1450 BC. Gujarat is the India's wild west, a geographical phenomena full of rustic beauty. Endless desert plains of the salty, alluvial, not flats, extensive dry grassland, great stretches of shallow water considered to be the crossroads of all Arctic migration streams witnessing significant waves of migratory birds in winter months, turning the water bodies of rough Kutch with pink and white reflection of the drifting flamingos and the pelicans. The only place in India where these feathered beauties lay eggs and bring up their chicks. salt marsh in Gujarati language. The little run is a birding paradise where the flamingos, pelicans, storks and denizen cranes migrate to the wetland of the wildlife sanctuary and is also the habitat of the endangered Asiatic wild ass who are able to survive without water in the summer months when the temperature rises about 50 Celsius. In this plain, there are the rubbery tribes who are the nomadic and semi-nomadic pastoralists moving from one place to another carrying their entire household on the camel's back. Their folk art in form of embroidery highlights the traditional Gujarat's Kachi ancient culture going back to the Harappan period of almost 2500 BC. <laughs> Now let me let me uh, let me go back to to, to the moon questions if you are asking that what happens to the Indus Valley civilization. Now before going to the Thola Vira, we attempted we attempted uh, we attempted with one more uh, IBC site which is at Biran, Biran. 
The principal reason that I uh, went there because there the entire civilization is preserved from its earliest nascent phase to the final demands. Okay? And the questions which people have been asking that why this civilization uh, decimated one of the very prevalent theory was prolonged drought. It is not very wrong. Other was interpersonal violence. Uh, as you can see that in Mohenjo-Daro you have a huge barrier. Okay? And it looks like kind of mass murders. Uh, the, 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 the anatomy group of John Hopkins University, they have studied the anatomy. As you can see, they have got in many, many of these skeletons cut mark and that led them to publish a paper in class. Uh, was one that about the interpersonal violence was too much because of the resource crunches. Okay. There was also other kind of theories like uh, there were uh, infectious diseases because the John Hopkins people found that many of these people were suffering from leprosy and many other infectious diseases. So therefore there are a variety of theories which were there for the you know, collapse of the industrial civilization. Okay? What we did is that we wanted to see that if the climate had any role at all. So in Virana, as you can see here, we have pre harappan we have already harappan we have already mature harappan and we have mature harappan. So all these stages are preserved in the Virana. And the first thing what we did, we started dating the materials. There were some carbon coding next year, but we also started some of this pre harappan material by optically stimulated luminescence with my collaborators at POA. The first thing it surprised us that this is your conventional Indus Valley Civilization time scale. 5,300 years to 2,900 years or you know, 1900 BC. What we see that the early Harappan began at least about 8,000 years before. And that means that the civilization, at least in Indian part, is at least 2,000 to 2,500 years older than what you find in Harappa and Mani. That was the first very, very surprising data which even Pakistanis do not believe today. Okay? Subsequent to our paper, the, the, the largest newspaper in Pakistan is gone and they said that the Indian scientists are telling something wrong. We have the greatest heritage and nothing can be older than us. Okay? But then science does not go by your claim. Uh, nobody wrote any rejoinder. So obviously we also were not bound to give any answer. That is number one. Number two, during this time period, for example, around 9,000 years to you know, 7,000 years, this blue bar, it tells by isotope that there was a very strong monsoon. And this one we were knowing for a very, very long time. Those whoever is doing Holocene climate, they know that that was the Holocene optima when the monsoon was extremely stronger, two, three times than today. And that is the time to have been. This civilization grew around some of these river banks, in the very river channels. But interesting thing is that from 7,000 years onward, as you can see here, this is from a lake called Yuasa, where the lake level was very high. This is the Arabian Sea upwelling index, when the monsoon indicator suggests that upwelling and monsoon was very high. The monsoon started declining, and in Virana also, you see that the monsoon started declining at this time. Important thing to note is this, that this early Harappan, when they grew when the monsoon was very, very strong, they did not abandon the place. They continued, and they continued through 6,500, 5,000 to 2,800 years. They went through early mature Harappan, mature Harappan, and later on I will show you, it went up to even sometimes the post Harappan period. Okay? What does it mean? It means they adapted with the impending climate change. That was the first conclusion. And therefore, what they did, when we started looking at the grains which are preserved there, and not only me, Professor Richard Meadow from University College of London, who is essentially a palynologist, he found that during this time, they were growing large grain cereals like wheat and barley, which is water intensive. Quite, quite consistent, because you have a lot of monsoon, you grow wheat, barley, rice, this kind of stuff. But when the monsoon started declining, you see, they have switched over 
to small grain cereals like millet, which are what we call the drought resistant. And this is precisely today is happening. You can see it's a very remote island, and you have two small rivers as you can see here, which are completely dry. But if you look at the map, which has been reconstructed, you have a middle town, you have a lower town, you have a bailey. Each of these are for different category of people. Okay? For example, Bailey was a place where you know the servants used to stay. Okay? The castle was a place where the priest king used to stay. Any Indus Valley civilization, you will have these, you know, these separate areas which are of, which were probably occupied by different strata of people. This is how today the Gulabina has a completely exposed look like. Okay? And uh, this is a pillar which would close the gate. And if you go there, you can see the art which they have made, which is precise to the level of fraction of millimeter. First, it was very, very funny to know that how did they polish this material? 4,700 years back, they had a perfect polishing system. Not only that, the geometry was so good that the art here and the art here are exactly mirror image. Okay, if you measure them. So, so some kind of an excellent, you know, calculation, some arithmetic understanding must have been there during that time as old as uh, what we find in Kurabi. Secondly, what they did, they started building reservoirs. You must have heard about the great bath of Mahajanara. Okay? This is, is what one reservoir here. Okay? Huh? These are early early, early yes. I will give you some of the time scales so that you can be clear. But they did a very funny thing. If you go to a hill, you have a reservoir. They build the reservoir at different levels. Okay? And each reservoir is connected by pipes. So if it is raining here, the excess water does not get wasted, it goes to the next reservoir. Okay? Such excellent water, you know, harvesting technology they have. This is a pipe which you can see a drainage come pipe where they were draining the water into the reservoir or even the wastewater they were doing. So they had developed an excellent drainage system, excellent city planning, excellent water harvesting system at a time, you know, about 5,000 years ago. Okay. These are some of the uh, materials which have been obtained from Bolavira and the Jinkans uh, what we call the seal, the bangle which I was telling. In addition to that, what they did is they used to eat these by, uh, these gastropods. These gastropods' name are Teribralia palustris. Okay, you find them where you find them in mangrove. Okay, this is how they were cutting. Excellent cutting. You will find as if they are cut by machine. What they were doing? They were taking the meat out of this and eating. Okay? Like today also you eat mussels, they were using it as a food. Even today, many of the coastal regions of Gujarat, Maharashtra, or even the Middle East, the coastal Oman, they use it as a food material. Okay? And these were profusely found at various levels of Gulabi. At a place where you make the desert and you have all these mangrove forests. So my archaeological collaborator, because I don't understand archaeology every day, I learn because I don't understand that anyway. They were telling there must have been mangrove. Okay, but I never believed this. Okay. So then what we did, we started doing isotopes on this. Okay. And as you can see, this is when the Dulamina was being excavated. The lower part belongs to the earliest stage, which is the early Harappan, the mid Harappan, then the late Harappan. Okay. And at each of these levels, we have these terribly patches. Okay? So what we did, we started analyzing. But before I tell what story we found out, this is a map of 1746 British Shardia map, which was done during the Mughal period. Okay, 1746, I don't remember who was the Mughal king, but he employed a Britisher to show this map. You can clearly see the Indus River here, okay? But you can also see that parallel to the Indus River, there is another river. And you see this? This is your run of touch. This is Gulf of Kambi. And this is the Kori Creek. This river was there at least up to 1746. What is this river? If you go to touch today, you see that there is a river called Nara River. Okay? That 
that Nara River has, the Pakistan has made a dam over it that is the largest canal project in Pakistan like our Narmada Canal and therefore the entire Nara River today is dry. Majority of the water which comes in the Nara River at the Hindu Pakistan border, at the border security force, it has been impounded and that water is extremely polluted and nothing can be done. Okay? But this is over, let us say, last about 50 years or 60 years what has been done. During this time, this was probably a very, very actively flowing river which was there. At least this British map shows during that time. Subsequently, uh, Space Application Center people started working on this on some of the very valuable channels. As you can see, the INSI Series 3 was I showing that there are some paleo channels. This is, a paleo, this, are, this is basically the Indus River, and as you can see, that there are some very paleo channels. They named it Saraswati, I do not know what is Saraswati or not, but there was some kind of very paleo channel which was debouching into the Ramakans. I will not go into the detail, I will tell you what the conclusions are. This is a, is a kind of uh, under division in Journal of Quaternary Science. Uh, the reason that we complete we, we submitted in Journal of Quaternary Science, I will come in a minute. But the, but the main points are the isotope data indicate presence of water derived from glacial meltwater. That means the water which was coming in the mangrove. In the mangrove, that water had some contribution from the glacial rivers. Okay? And this paper basically we finalized when Professor Rajajaria was also there uh, in our IIT. We started discussing every day. Uh, we also did it by many other proxies like fish overeat and all, where laser ablation studies we have done. But then we were wondering that where from the glacial meltwater is coming from? You look at the peninsular India river, there is no glacial meltwater. Ganges does not have. Whatever glacial component of Ganges is there, in the upland of the Ganges that is over and in the downstream of the Ganges, you only get monsoon fed water. Okay? There is no glacial component. Then we started looking at the Indus River. What we saw very surprisingly that even today, the Indus River contains very significant glacial fed water component. The reason being that it's starting from Indus Sampo, it comes to the upland of the Pakistan and probably the southwest monsoon does not reach that much. The only monsoonal component which goes to the Pakistan today is from the Arabian Sea. So therefore, relatively speaking, the glacial meltwater component is still preserved in the Indus Sampo. Okay? And if the Nara river or Saraswati river or whatever river you say was debouching into the Aral of Kach, if it was creating a, some kind of, you know, embryonic delta or a mangrove, and if the territory of palace trees were growing there, there is a, every possibility that those gastropod carbonate were also recording the oxygen isotopic composition of those glacial meltwaters. Okay? So, most probable candidate, as we say, is some distributary of the river in dust. Every, every river has a distributary, right? When you have a delta, distributary of anybody in us that bows in the Ram Kach. And the third thing what we found out that when you go to what you call upper level of this Bolavia, which is kind of you know late part of the mature Harappan or early part of early Harappan period, around 4,000 years, this is completely gone. Okay? The river shows evidence of extreme aridity. Extreme aridity, okay? When you look at the age, 4,300 years, we found out that this age exactly coincides with the age which has been recently proposed as the Mingalpan age. Okay? If you are aware, so, so let, let, me, let me summarize. This is what, when we get a very high monsoon period when a lot of glacial meltwater com components were coming and by the time you come over here in the Dolamita, you know, the civilization collapses, extreme aridity sets in. And these civilization collapsing, development and collapsing were already worked out by the archaeologists. Archaeologists knew that they had very rapidly grew. For example, they were building continuously one layer of the other, very fast they were building, they were diversifying, they were expanding their areas. 
But by the time it comes around 4,300 years, everything stopped. The buildings started collapsing. They were not maintaining the buildings. They were not painting the buildings. Okay, the walls were collapsing, and eventually all the reservoirs which were there, they are all abandoned. This was a structure which was already proposed by the archaeologists. When we started dating in and with high resolution media lines, that this happened probably the waters become extremely scarce. Okay, probably a kind of major drought which had set in around 4300 to 4100 years ago. And thereafter, as the documentary said, they wanted to come back again. They could not come back. Okay? A complete enemy sets in the run of touch and they have to Okay? So the Dolamina ends somewhere here, which is about 3800 years last we have been able to date. The top most part, there was no data in the Kiria. And we think today that it is probably because of this revival age which the International Subcommission on Stratigraphy has actually proposed in very, very recent years. Okay? One of their proposition is that it is this time when not only the Dholabira, but also all civilizations across the globe they collapsed. You call it an Akkadian, Akkadian Empire, you call the Chinese Empire, you call the Mesopotamian Empire, everywhere it shows the collapsing almost at the same time. It can never be for Okay, And that is why when we were designed when to publish this, this Meghalaya age actually was published in Journal of Quaternary Science by a group of consortium of scientists headed by my Walker. And I was not knowing because I am not very conversant with archaeological journal. So I asked him that which journal do you think that I should publish? So he says that this is the journal where we suggested Meghalaya age and we predict that probably most of the civilization could have because of this now. And if your evidence is telling, that would be a fantastic support for our case. Although, as I say, that you will find that many stratigraphers do not believe that really this is a global event. Okay? Many stratigraphers do not believe. They think that it has been too premature to assign uh, an, 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 a an age uh, during the Holocene, Holocene period. But the data what we have got, it probably suggests that at least Bolivia definitely collapsed by some kind of heredity and major drought by 4,300. And obviously, Dolabira being closest to that as compared to Mesopotamia at all, I think we have enough strong evidence to suggest that this was caused essentially by a major drought and therefore it decimated. Okay? This is a compilation I tried to make of all the Indus Valley civilization sites in India. Okay? It starts from Alibangan, in Rajasthan, Rakhi Guri, Prabhash Patan, Lothal, Kirshara, Kanmet, Sukhrotada, Rusdi, Rodeshwar and Bodhavya. But you see, you see, come around you know, 4,300 years, they already started diminishing. They started shrinking. And why about 3,900 years, why are not everybody disappears? Okay? There must be a universal figuring mechanism. Okay? And we suspect that probably this figuring mechanism was the drought. Okay? By this time, the entire Horopai Mojito was abandoned. Nothing was there. Okay? The, the cities were deserted, no evidence of human settlements are there, and exactly the same things are happening here. While we are doing these things, one question we also ask that what happened to these people, this post-carbon Horopai? Okay? Where did they live? Where did they go? We started exploring in the run of Kutch and southern part of Pakistan. Okay? And what we find? These remains. These remains are from 3000 years. Remember that Indus Valley civilization ends at roughly, you know, 3900 years. Okay? It goes maximum up to 3300 years. From 3300 years, in Gujarat region, northwestern India, till 2500 years, which is the beginning of the Iron Age, no evidence was there. In archaeology book and history book, they call it as a dark age. Nothing is known. But this 1000 years, what was happening, nobody knew. This civilization disappeared, and only at 2500 years, the Iron Age started in the Gujarat. When we started taking this, we find that the settlements are there, from 3,000 years onwards, 
where you get this kind of fantastic archaeological remains, the cities too, as good as medieval time, therefore the continuity of the settlement was existing. Okay? What we essentially conclude that absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. What we do not know because we have never looked into it. Okay? There must be, there must be settlements within the Ranakaj, in the Thought Desert D, where human settlements probably were there. Yeah. And our suspicion is that as the river started drying up, as the monsoon became with weaker, people started migrating in the eastern side. Okay? So what we what we consider what United Nations, you have all heard about the climate change, and climate change eventually bring out a very, very common, you know, common term which is called climate refugee and climate refugee. That means if today the Sundarbon Delta sinks, all the people will come down. Okay? Everywhere it is happening. So if you have a drought, they will be migrating. But we think that probably these people were also migrating in the eastern part and therefore they started coming to the Ganponga plain. Okay? And therefore the Iron Age started, therefore the painted grey were started. And this is something what we call something which again let me show you. You have seen this. This is this has a very typical Bollywood masala. But Professor Kenoya from Wisconsin Medicine is their scientific advisor. So at least we get some sensible suggestion that they might like to do that. Okay. And look back at the Indus Valley people. 
monsoon was continuously decreasing from 5,000 years till 3,000 years. 2,000 years they survived with no technology. This can only be possible if you have a society which is a participatory society where greed does not prevail, you survive. Okay? So with these few words, I must thank you. But before that, I must also tell that I had a whole lot of collaborators apart from students, Professor Jameen Duel, who have been constantly dating uh, all these um, potteries for me, Dr. Dorit Sivan, uh, Haifa Israel, uh, who, with whom I have worked on the Israeli staff, Dr. Haroki Deshpande from Deshan College, have been uh, studying the potteries, uh, Professor A.K. Dhafkar, Gaurav uh, Chauhan, they were basically from the Kachi University, without their help I could not have gone to these places uh, because some of the places you have permission from uh, what you call uh, uh, army Professor Subhi Vera from Calcutta University does a lot of paleontology uh, for us Dr. Ravi Bhushan does uh, uh, the accelerator uh, aspect of dating and Dr. Ares Bish he was basically the discoverer okay he is 89 years old but still very very active and he is also a co-author of our paper which is and also I had a whole lot of uh, what you call um, sponsoring agencies including I must specifically mention Infosys Foundation they thought that it is what funding so they gave us some little money so that we could drill and we could uh, you know uh, study and of course Indian Army was a very very young okay at middle of the night when your car is stuck deep inside the hot desert uh, deep inside the run of car they will come pull the truck so very nicely they will give very nice chicken curry and rice so that is why so without Indian army I think you have done thank you very much